There we go. Okay, so uh, let's talk about models with time varying hazard. Uh, and, and again, we're still talking about time to event data. Uh, so there are a number of cases where that might be relevant, particularly in some of the sorts of pharmacometric applications that we might run into. A uh, fairly typical one is the first one here where uh, we may wish to model the hazard is a function of our drug exposure. So, and so as I state here, the risk of an event at some particular time may be a function of the mag magnitude of drug exposure at that time. Uh, and drug exposure may vary over time, particularly if we're talking about exposure as measured by plasma concentrations. So that would be one instance where we might have a time-dependent hazard. Uh, another one here I mentioned is there might be some form of tolerance that results in a reduced incidence of events over time. Uh, and maybe we might want to construct a model where the risk of an event is causally related to some observable response that varies with time. Uh, for ex example, I give here is the risk of dropout may be increased by perceived lack of efficacy and that uh, lack of efficacy may be, uh, well, it's, that lack of efficacy might be measured in terms of some particularly particular efficacy-related measurement. Uh, in fact, the example I'll give you will re will relate to this one, and so if, and if that's varying over time, then uh, the hazard of dropout would vary over time. And those again are just a few examples. We could imagine all kinds of possibilities. I'm sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's talk about that. Now, I've actually already given you sort of the core equations in the past for this, and we've, but the models we've dealt with up to now have been sort of a simplified case. So now we're going to have to step back to those more general equations for, uh, for the likelihood when we have a, a hazard that may vary continuously over time. And as I mentioned here, then uh, the implementation of such a model is going to involve integration of the hazard function within that likelihood function. And as before, I sort of list the likelihood function for our different cases. So we've got the likelihood for uh, event times when they've actually been observed. So if we've actually observed our, uh, our, our event and we know what time it occurs at, then uh, our likelihood here you can see is going to be, we've got our hazard multiplied by E, uh, to the minus the integral of the hazard over time. Uh, in the case where uh, we're dealing with censoring, uh, if we've got right censored data, uh, again we're using our survival function uh, is equivalent to our likelihood, and again that's e to the minus the integrated hazard. Uh, and then interval censored data then is then the difference between two survivals functions, and again that's going to involve those integrals. So to implement these things, then we need to have the tools that will allow us to do that integration. Uh, either we, we, ha we would need to be dealing with a hazard which is analytically integrable, or in the more general case, we'd have to uh, use some sort of numerical method then for doing that integration. Uh, and I just mentioned that uh, if we're going to implement such models, uh, the in terms of some of the tools that we use here. Uh, commonly, say if you're going to do this in non-MEM, this would then be a matter of using one of the differential equation solvers uh, that are available as part of the uh, PREDPP component of non-MEM. So that would be you know something like ADVANCE 6, 8, or 13 then uh, would provide some sort of differential equation solver uh, in order to deal with the integral. Uh, and in WinBug's context, uh, there's probably two real choices in here. I just list one of them. Uh, one is to use one of the differential equation solvers that's available in uh, a package I put together called Bugs Model Library. And here I give you a URL where you can get that library. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and you can use that to do the integration. 
uh, within within wind bugs. Uh, the one other alternative uh, for wind bugs is uh, Dave Lunn a number of years ago put together a package uh, called WB Diff, uh, which also does differential equation uh, solving. Uh, the advantage to using Bugs Model Library over WB Diff uh, in in the pharmacometrics context is it's set up to use uh, non-MEM style data input for describing things like dosing regimens and so on. So it it uses that same sort of structure, and so it can deal with fairly complex uh, dosing event time courses. Whereas with uh, if you're going to do this with WB Diff, you'd have to do all the programming to deal with that yourself. Uh, another option is with Open Bugs. Uh, it has a built-in differential equation solver, uh, but again, it w it suffers from the same problem that if you are dealing with a uh, some sort of a complex uh, uh, dosing event history or something, you'd have to do all the programming for that yourself, which could be a bit cumbersome. Um, okay, so those were would be the mechanisms that you'd have to use in order to do a numerical integration. Again, if you're fortunate that your hazard function is uh, is integrable, then you would just have to do the integration yourself and write the resulting solution to the problem uh, within the bugs code. Now, the approach I'm going to talk about today is is to work with the case where your hazard function can be, as I say, described or approximated as piecewise constant, you know, essentially as a set of stair steps. Uh, in that case, uh, we can use a fairly simple identity uh, that comes out of working with, with the constant hazard model. Uh, because over each one of those intervals, then, if you have a constant hazard, uh, you can take advantage of the fact that you don't have to do a, you know, a particularly complicated integral. It's the, over each interval, the integral is very simple, and we take advantage of that. Uh, and another way you can actually look at it, then, is that the duration of each constant hazard interval prior to an event uh, and during which no event occurs. For, so this is the case where... We've got, you know, we've got some event, say, at some time, I don't know, we'll call it T, T star, let's say. So if for any interval up to but not including one that contains that T star, uh, the hazard then will be constant within each one of those intervals, and we can treat uh, that interval then as a right-censored time to an event that comes from an exponential distribution. And then when you finally get to that final interval, uh, that one you're then going to treat, uh, you know, again, it's going to be a constant hazard, uh, and you're actually going to model then the time from the beginning of that interval to the time of the event as an exponential random variable. Uh, now, I suspect that was pretty confusing, and we'll make that concrete by an example. Uh, let's see, see a question or something popped up. Let's see. Let's see, see on page 165, I see integral from 0 to t for h and so on. I'm wondering what the u represents. Okay, let me just step back here. Uh, oops, wrong way. Uh, I'm guessing you actually meant 168. It might have been 165 on yours. I probably added something somewhere along the line. Uh, anyway, so I'm guessing you're talking about this slide. Uh, well, the U, keep in mind that that's just a, an, a variable of integration. So it's just some variable that takes on values that go from the beginning to the end of the integration interval. So in a sense they don't it doesn't represent anything until you you actually do the integral and plug in the endpoints where the 0 and the t then have a much more concrete meaning meaning uh you know a, they're referring to specific times. If you like you can think of the u as representing uh 
representing any time. It's re or actually it's representing the whole range of times between zero and, and little t. Let's see. Okay, so we're on here. So again, you'll probably be able to wrap your heads around this statement a little bit better when we actually do the example. But basically what we're doing is we're taking, say, a single time to event variable and converting it into a sequence of time to event variables where all of them are right censored except for the last one. And you'll see how we do that in a minute. Uh, the other comment I have here is kind of separate from the implementation itself here, and it's just sort of a general caution here, and that's that time varying hazard models pose a pretty serious identifiability problem when we're modeling just a time to a single event. Uh, and in particular, it's, it's often not possible to distinguish between uh, whether a constant hazard model or a time varying hazard model is, uh, is more appropriate uh, working with some particular set of data. So for, and this is particularly true if let's say you've, uh, you've got data from one study, you've got a, you're working with a time to a single event in each one of your patients uh, in here, uh, and and if you look across the patients, now if you if you simply look at the survival curve, the implication of the survival curve might be that, gee, it looks like the hazard is varying with time. And if each person has the same hazard, that's you could pro you know, if you were comfortable with making that assumption, you might be able to discern whether or not the hazard really varies with time. Um, but the problem is, is the reason that you may see that profile that seems to vary with time may instead be a consequence of inter-individual variation. And, and again, with time to a single event data, it's difficult to discern for sure which of those options uh, represents the reality. So this isn't so much saying give up, it's just more a matter of saying uh, just be cautious on how you know the conclusions you reach uh, based upon sort of an apparent time variation when looking at that kind of data. Okay, so let's try and uh, hopefully make the concept clear by by using a more concrete example. Uh, so what I'm going to do is use a model that we used for an example earlier or use the data that we used for an example earlier, plus some additional information. Uh, before we had modeled uh, dropouts uh, in a study for an antipsychotic agent, and, uh, and in that case, in fact, let's actually step back to that case. Sorry for the quick run back here. Okay, so the case, the example I had had was right here. Uh, where I w we were modeling uh, the data using a constant hazard model. Uh, it was a phase two dose finding trial. There were four treatment arms uh, where we had placebo and three different doses of our potential antipsychotic here. Uh, and uh, I commented that the efficacy was assessed based upon weekly PAN scores, which actually was an unnecessary piece of information at that time, but now it will be relevant. Uh, and we had done a fairly simple model where there was a single covariate, namely dose. So that's where you can see we modeled the hazard uh, is, is constant within any individual, uh, but where it w depended upon the dose uh, administered to that individual. So that's the model we used then. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of, well, actually, let me, before I go to that step remind you that where do we go here what we had seen in that is that the uh, the hazard actually seemed to go down as the dose went up uh, which seemed to be cons which would seem to be consistent with a case where maybe lack of efficacy was a dominant reason for uh, for dropouts in that study so let's, that was the core thing we we're working with. So now let's go to 
revisiting that data. Okay. Um, so we're going to revisit that. Uh, based on what we saw, we thought it was likely that dropout behavior, well, in general, dropout behavior is influenced by things like e efficacy uh, and adverse events, uh, you know, and who knows what else, but those, certainly those. Uh, but in this study, uh, we can hypothesize that efficacy, I'm sorry, that dropout would be influenced by both efficacy measured by uh, the PAN score and perhaps by adverse events, things like maybe CNS adverse events, uh, CNS depression maybe, and extrapyramidal symptoms and so on. But for our examples, we're going to keep things simple and stick with what appeared to be the dominant source uh, of dropout, or at least the dominant source of dose-dependent dropout, and that was uh, lack of efficacy. Uh, and what we're going to do this time, instead of using dose as our covariate, we're going to construct a model where the hazard depends upon the PAN score. And recall the PAN score is measured on a weekly basis, and this was over, what was it, a six-week period, I believe. Uh, and we're going to construct a model where the hazard depends upon the PAN score observed at the most re recent weekly visit uh, in this case. So now, perhaps more ideally, we'd make it dependent upon uh, maybe the model predicted PAN score where we actually had a model for describing the PAN score as a function of time, uh, in which case we'd have to use a... Uh, uh, the approach required when we have a continuously varying uh, hazard. But in this case, we've only got PAN scores at certain discrete points, and we're going to use the observed value rather than some model predicted quantity for PANs. And we know it at certain discrete points, and the choice we're going to use here is to assume that the hazard is constant over the period since the most recent PAN score measurement. So we're going to work with that approach that I talked about when we have a piecewise constant hazard. So it's it's varying with time overall, but over any short period of time, it it's going to the hazard will be constant. Okay, so let's take a look at what the model would have to look like uh, for a wind bugs implementation. Uh, did I actually? I guess I never wrote the equations for the model, but they pretty much look like what we've got right here. Okay, so the bugs model, as I say here, is nearly identical to the one we used when we were just modeling uh, dropout as a function of dose, but the difference now is our covariate, instead of being dose, it's now going to be pans change from baseline instead of dose. So we've got our usual kind of model, um, inter our, our model block, uh, going over all our observations. Uh, for our dropout here, uh, that's just going to be uh, exponentially distributed with our hazard H uh, and our modifier here to deal with uh, possible right censoring. Uh, and we're going to have to provide as data, we're going to have to provide the T-drop value as well as the T-sensor value in the data. Uh, our hazard, uh, I've got it as h naught e to the beta times the difference uh, between the PAN score and the baseline. In other words, it's PAN's change from baseline in here. Uh, and I used, again, uh, weekly informative priors down here. And then we also write out this thing to get, the, uh, get our posterior predictions in here. So this doesn't look much different than what we saw before. The key difference is actually going to be not in the way we write the model here, but in the way we construct the data. Uh, in order to describe the hazard as piecewise constant, what we're going to do is break up that single time to event measurement per person into a sequence of, uh, of data where we're going to have one value for time for each for time to event for each week over our six-week interval, uh, or yeah, overall six-week interval for the study. So for each week, we're going to have a time. That time may be a censored time or an observed time. 
uh, for the for a dropout event. Uh, but there will always be an observation for each one of those each week. So that's bringing it up right here. So as I say, the bigger difference here is in the data set. Uh, we're going to have a T drop record uh, for each for each week. And so you can see here we've got uh, our different columns here, patient dose, our baseline pans, uh, the time and weeks, uh, the PAN score at that time. And, uh, okay, I may need to reconcile something in my head here. Uh, what, what's bothering me here is I just saw 90 and 91 here, and I'm trying to decide why that would be the case. Um, I'll reconcile that later here. Let's work on the basic premise for now. Uh, okay, so we've got our our pan zero, and we have uh, the pans for that same for uh, the various times. Uh, and then we have a uh, our dropout time. Uh, now the way this is coded in here in the data set is I've gone ahead and entered in the uh, dropout time. Uh, I just repeated whatever it is for that individual in here. Uh, let's see, I got a question from uh, Andreas. Let me see, a coding question. Side 172, can I put exp log h0? Let me uh, step back. Here, take a look. Uh, norm. Uh, no. Uh, it uh, the uh, to answer your question, Andreas, it won't let you use that. Uh, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons why you can't do that. Um, one, uh, the only functions you can put on the left-hand side of an assignment are log, uh, and let's see, it's log, uh, logit, and uh, complementary log log. Those are the only three that WinBugs will let you put on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. Uh, two, the other, so the exponential you couldn't do it on. Two, you uh, you can't do the sort of left-hand assignment approach with um, with distributions. You can only do it for for actual assignments, things that have the left-hand arrows in it, not things that have the tilde. Okay, step back here. Okay, back to the data here. Okay, so I've got my dropout. I've just basically all I've done here is is just repeated the dropout time uh, for all six weeks in here, and then we're going to do some data management in the uh, in the R function here in order to or in the R script in order to get these things in exactly the form we need to pass them to WinBugs. And that's what's going on here. And I uh, see as I look at this, I wish I had put more comments inside here for you. Okay, but let me step through the key bits here. Okay, so the first bit is, I was just reading in the data, so you've seen that before. Uh, this next bit here is calculating a quantity that I've called uh, T end in here. So that's basically calculating the, uh, uh, the end point time for the interval. See, let me step back and check something here. No, okay. Um, so what this is going through, and i got to remind myself exactly what I did. Oh, okay. So what this is going to do is create a sort of a second time column uh, that's, gonna re that's going to basically calculate the endpoint time for each interval here. So keep in mind we've got uh, six time points representing here going from, you know, you can see going from zero to six, but there's actually, what is there, five intervals here? Uh, and what it's going to do is going to create a T end value here. So in the case where time is zero, that end value is going to be a one, where it's a one, it's going to be a two, or it's a two, it's a three. So all I've done there is just creating a second thing. So I'm marking out what the beginning and end of the interval is that we're going to have our constant hazard. 
So that's all that's going on in this block right here. Uh, the next part here is uh, getting rid of a couple of things here. Uh, it's getting rid of any of the rows where uh, the pans value is missing. In addition, uh, one consequence of this step above is to create a row where T end is missing and it's also going to get rid of that particular row. So when you get done with this, there's actually going to only be at most five rows per patient for our particular example. Uh, the next step in here is to create a new variable we're going to call censored, uh, which is going to be, well, it's going to be true if it's the data is a censoring event, or if it's a, or, or it'll be false if it's not a censoring event. So, for example, in this case, what would happen, say, for our patient one, uh, this is going to be a situation where our first interval from go, will go from zero to one week, and for that week, uh, it's going to be a censoring event because the T drop value is bigger than the end of that interval. Uh, for the second one, which goes from one to two weeks, uh, 1.77 is contained in that week. So in that case, I can't remember the way I said it. So for the first week, censoring will be true. For the second week, censoring will be false. Uh, on the other hand, for our subject number two down here, uh, in that case, the event never occurs uh, in any one of those intervals. So each one of those would have a, uh, the censoring will be uh, true. Uh, so it's that one. Um, oh, and this next one here is just resetting the T end to the dropout time for those intervals in which dropout actually occurs. So I've done some data massaging up there. Uh, and then finally, when we create the final bit that we pass to win bugs, uh, some of it's pretty familiar. We pass on the number of observations. Uh, we pass on our covariates here, our PAN score and our baseline PAN score. And then for our T drop, for both of our time values, this T drop and the T sensor, uh, we actually have to put those in terms of the difference from the beginning of the time interval. So you can see uh, over here, this is calculating a difference. So for the we're going with the difference between T end and time. The time is actually the beginning of the interval. And I do the same thing down here for a T censoring. But then the other side of this is is calculating the appropriate things where if if it does, if the data actually is censored, we want our T drop value to be missing. And it's only going to be uh, this value on the right hand side uh, in the case where an event has occurred. Uh, and then finally for the T-censoring, now this is another example where I'm actually doing overkill. I actually could have just passed the difference that's on the right-hand side for every one of those because, again, if uh, if there's actually an observed value, the T-sensor value is going to get ignored. Uh, but I got a little bit carried away and went through the trouble that if it's not censored, uh, it's going to put in a value of zero, and if it is, it's going to put the difference uh, in here, is that right? Yeah. So that's the basic deal here then in putting this together. So it's basically a lot of bookkeeping uh, compared to what we do with just the single time to event. Uh, but again, it's just breaking this thing up into uh, this overall time period into all the intervals during which we're going to model the hazard is constant. Uh, and then, well, this is just showing you the results uh, for that case. Uh, and I'm trying to think if there's more that I wanted to show you in the, you know what? I think what it might be useful to do, will it? Now, let me go ahead and just show you this for the time being. Um, so this is just showing you the fits. Uh, now, one, you can see for all of our different uh, Dose, dose groups here, so we're looking at fraction of patients remaining in the trial versus time. 
uh, and so you can see the observed uh, Kaplan-Meier curve here overlaid with the model predicted uh, fraction of patients remaining in the trial. Uh, there's some you know some systematic variation here and there but overall it's capturing it uh, and you see as expected here the higher the dose the less dropout there is and it's capturing that. Now one issue that we do find is at least in this particular instance uh, we, d we gain fairly limited benefit by the additional complication because uh, we see it's the fits really only slightly better than what we saw with the constant hazard model where we just had the um, dropouts dependent on dose uh, but but again we were able to at least describe this uh, in this fashion actually I should point you I should probably provide you with the reference on this because uh, uh, the let's see it was um, I can remember which individual in Mott's Carlson's group did this um, it's one of the group people in the Uppsala group um, I want to say Lena Freiberg probably did this. Um, uh, actually, did essentially uh, this kind of a model uh, in in the context of an of some antipsychotic data, uh, and definitely showed some real benefit to uh, to using it for the case she was working on. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's any embellishment I want to um, uh, to put on this for you. Um, well, the one thing I should comment is this, uh, you do have this example uh, in the materials I had given you at the outset. It's labeled TTE Example 2, uh, so you can actually go in and uh, dig around that. One thing I might encourage you to do is convince yourself uh, that this nonsense here that I've got uh, as far as the data management uh, actually, uh, you know, one, that it actually does work, and two, to try and get your head around uh, how it's actually set up uh, in, in the end in terms of what's being passed uh, to wind bugs. Uh, in fact, maybe we should just briefly mention, so what we ultimately end up sending to wind bugs for the example that you see up here uh, is wind bugs is going to see, uh, it's going to see the dose, it's going to see the baseline pans and the pans at uh, at a particular time. Uh, it's going to get, instead of the beginning and the ending of the interval, what I'm passing to it is the difference between the beginning and the end of the interval. So what it will see, for instance, for patient one is, first of all, it, one of the steps in the data management actually removes uh, the last uh, few rows here so you actually only end up with two rows uh, in it uh, the first one is going to pass a time period basically a difference in time uh, equal to one and the value it's going to pass for for t drop is going to be a one uh, and it's going to indicate that it's censored actually it's going to pass a t censoring value of one uh, for that case and then for the second row, it's going to pass uh, again a it's going to pass a uh, a value for t drop of 0.77 for that second hour uh, because it's because that's because what's happened is we've got the patient starting out again at one hour, but then they drop out 0.77 hours later. So that's or I'm sorry, weeks in this case. Uh, so, so it's going to pass two rows for that case. For the second person here, it's going to pass, uh, what is it going to be? Again, we've got five intervals, zero to one. Is it five or am I getting that wrong? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It is six intervals because it's going to go zero to one, one to two, two to three, uh, and up to five to six. And, and for each one of those, it's going to pass a time. Basically, it's going to have a T sensor time of one. Uh, that's going to be passed to wind bugs. So that's that's the management that's going on. Uh, and I did it in R instead of doing it in the original data set. Alternatively, we could have just constructed the original data set that way. Okay, so I'm actually going to move to a new topic, or at least get it started. 
Uh, so let me take a breath before I do that to see uh, to see if there's any further questions on this, since some of this was probably a little bit confusing. Okay, nothing popping up yet, but in case there's a long question or a slow typer out there, I'll keep my eyes open here. Because uh, the, the next topic I wanted to go to was talking about modeling repeated time to event data. Because uh, up to now we've just been talking about modeling uh, time to a single event uh, in any particular individual. But of course there are things that can happen more than once. Uh, and we might like to uh, uh, to model those multiple events. Uh, and the first thing I'll just start out mentioning is, you know, that you know there'd be m more than one way of dealing with uh, with multiple events of the same. And in particular, I'm talking about multiple events of the same kind. I guess that uh, raises a maybe that's another thing I should put on the list of potential topics is um, there are also approaches that one might want to take when you're modeling multiple events of a different kind um, where there might be some dependencies across those uh, that's another category of uh, of analysis that might be of interest anyway so we're talking about modeling multiple events of the same kind well, one approach is to just ignore all the events except the first one uh, and model the time to the first event. Uh, you'll actually see that done pretty frequently in clinical trials, um, in part because it's it's something you can do fairly easily without making uh, as strong a set of assumptions as you will have to if you want to model uh, all of the events. Uh, another would be to, instead of modeling the time to the events or between the events, you model the number of events, which is what we talked about when we were talking about modeling count data. So that's just equivalent to that. Uh, and finally, the other main approach uh, that would be a little more comprehensive is to model the time between events, in other, and where I've, or as I've stated it here, modeling the inter-event time intervals. Uh, and that's uh, and that's the approach we're going to be taking a look at. Um, it's at least conceptually a fairly straightforward extension of the approach that are, that's used for single events. So what we're going to do is instead of modeling only the time of an event relative to the start of the study, I'm going to model uh, the time from a previous event or the start of the study, whichever occurs whatever occurs last, I guess. Uh, so, so basically what we're doing is for the first event, you're modeling the time from the uh, beginning of observation to when it occurs, and then for all subsequent ob events, you model the time from the previous event. Uh, as I comment here is that approach is potentially more informative than modeling count data, uh, particularly if hazard is going to be varying over time. Uh, and, you know, if there's sufficient individuals that experience multiple, multiple events, then modeling inter-individual uh, variation becomes feasible uh, as part of this. So now we're getting into a realm where mixed effects modeling is meaningful. Uh, and that's actually something I didn't really comment on in the case of talking about time to single event. When you're only modeling time to a single event, it's uh, there's basically not enough information to... Uh, to model inter-individual variation. Uh, the only sort of surrogate to to that, to trying to model inter-individual variation with, uh, 
when you're dealing with time to a single event is if you make a strong assumption about the hazard time course, then deviations from that hazard time course might be uh, might be es might be something you can describe by incorporating uh, a random effect uh, as part of it. I think that's what is often referred to as fragility modeling in uh, in when you look at the survival analysis literature. But anyway, with when you have multiple events, similar to having when you have multiple observations with with other types of data, uh, it now makes uh, characterizing inter-individual variation possible. Uh, now what I'm actually going to be doing is we're actually going to be leaping, uh, I'm going to sort of throw you in the deep end, uh, as it were, and up to now I've always been sort of doing a full example and then having you do uh, a case as a hands-on. I'm going to sort of throw you in the deep water and make you do, and and actually sort of learn this one by doing. Uh, you know, I'll give you the sort of specifications of the problem. The idea is you're going to have to build on, uh, you'll have to build on what you've already done for the, uh, for the modeling of time to a single event uh, in order to accomplish this. And then on Thursday, we'll, we'll go over it. So, as I say, let's use hands-on problem six to illustrate it. Uh, and let me set the groundwork for that. So we're coming back to our uh, hypothetical cystic fibrosis case. And I'm saying, suppose the trial we modeled back on hands-on problem one, suppose it continued for one year instead of 24 weeks. And as I say there, that's just kind of an artifice to, to make sure we'll have enough multiple events to make it interesting. Over 24 weeks, uh, when I used a sort of realistic value for hazard of these uh, exacerbation events, the number of people that had multiple events was fairly small, so I extended the duration. Uh, so again, this was a phase two dose finding trial in cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, it's a parallel design, 100 patients per dose arm. Uh, with our different doses of ME2, placebo 20, 40, and 60 milligrams per day. Uh, and in this case, we're going to give it over 52 weeks. Uh, the efficacy measurement now is going to be the times uh, of pulmonary exacerbations. Uh, sorry, yeah, times of pulmonary exacerbation events. So we have potentially multiple exacerbation events in uh, in individuals, and we're going to be modeling the time, the well, the inter-event times uh, for these for these events. Uh, so covariates that might be of interest here are going to be things like age, baseline, FEV1, our concomitant meds, and we've dealt with this in some of our past where we looked at uh, looked at uh, uh, RHDNA uh, treatment or uh, treatment with chronic antibiotics in here. Uh, so uh, I'm proposing you construct a model for these uh, potentially multiple times to pulmonary exacerbation of events. Uh, for now, assume that the hazard is, we're going to assume that the hazard, once you adjust for the specific covariates, is constant. Uh, and, 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 well, and, and it's constant for all of the intervals. For There's not a difference, for instance, between the first interval, second interval, and so on uh, in here. So it's going to be constant, or at least constant within an individual, uh, but there would be the potential for uh, inter-individual variation in that hazard. Uh, we've got a data file here. Uh, maybe we should actually take a peek at that. Okay, so this is hands-on six. Uh, okay, here it is. Okay, so we've got now the patient identifier becomes uh, more relevant in here uh, because we have possibly more than one event per individual. Uh, so you can see we've got our identifiers here. Uh, notice that, for instance, uh, you'll see differences in numbers. So, for instance, for 
uh, for patient one, there's only one uh, row here. For patient two, I've got three rows, and you'll see other variations along the way. Uh, we've got uh, the uh, the daily dose for the patient, uh, their baseline FEV1, an indicator for whether or not they're on chronic antibiotics, zero for uh, false and one for true. Same thing for the RHDNase. Uh, we've got age, uh, and then we've got the time at which either they've dropped out or an exacerbation occurred. Uh, and then a censored column here indicating whether uh, the data is censored. So we can see, for example, for our patient one, well, it looks like they, uh, the under here, under T exacerbation, I've got a 49, but notice it's censored as one. So actually, they did not have a, an exacerbation event during the time when the patient was being observed. They, uh, they went as far as 49 weeks and either dropped out or uh, maybe they just didn't quite make it to 52 weeks anyway, but one way or the other, that's a censoring event. Whereas uh, for subject five, what we see is we've got uh, an exacerbation event at 18 weeks, at 20.43 weeks, uh, and then finally something here at 52, but you can see that on the censoring column here, we've got a zero, zero, and then a one. So what we've got is We've got an event at 18 weeks, one at 20.43, and then at 52, well, that's just the end of the study. Uh, so that we've actually only observed two exacerbations for that individual. Uh, so that's the kind of pattern that you're going to be working with here. So you have to account for uh, both censoring events and uh, in there. And for most individuals, there will be a terminal censoring event. So this is the typical pattern you'll see. Either you'll have one value, one row where it's a censoring event, or you'll have multiple rows where the last one is a censoring event. Let's see what kind of what the data looks like here when we summarize it. Okay, this is a some representations of the data, uh, and these are. Um, these are now uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, deal, but they're Kaplan-Meier curves for the um, for the inter-event times in here. So, and you've got here, you've got uh, down here fraction of patients with no pulmonary exacerbation uh, versus time. Uh, you can see when we do these Kaplan-Meier curves in R, it puts like a plus sign wherever a censoring event occurs. So you can see we've got a whole bunch of censoring events here because for all the individuals, even those that um, that had some exacerbations, the terminal event's usually going to be a censoring event. So that's why you see all the little pluses uh, on these. Uh, you can see the general pattern here that the lowest curve is the placebo group. And as we go up here, the do or going up the uh, up these curves here, we're going to higher doses. So again, we see that uh, the that the uh, whatever the there are fewer exacerbations anyway in uh, in patients at higher doses, which of course is what we're hoping for. Uh, on the right hand graphs over here are just breaking the these patients up into two subgroups here. Uh, here, I've broken up the top curve is the patients who are not taking a chronic antibiotic, and the lower curve is those that are taking a, a chronic antibiotic. Basically, what we find is the ones that are on an antibiotic, uh, they have, one, they tend to have fewer exacerbation events. Two, uh, the incremental benefit of the new drug is smaller than it appears to be uh, for patients who are not on an antibiotic. And here's the model I'm suggesting you attempt to implement. Okay, so just orient you to the um, subscripts here. So we're going to have a constant hazard model for the ith occurrence of a pulmonary exacerbation in the jth patient. So I refers to occurrence, J is patient. 
uh, and the hazard is going to be a function of our dose, baseline FEV1, and chronic antibiotic. Uh, let's see, I guess I ignored the uh, RHDNA use in this case. So we've got our exacerbation time is going to be exponential. Our hazard is just going to be this H0 times a quantity I've labeled as E drug here. Um, our We've got our H0 here is log normally distributed. Uh, actually, this is, I guess I need to make this clear. We're now introducing inter individual variation, uh, but I'm just going to introduce it on the baseline hazard. So you can see it's, uh, I've got it as H, uh, sorry, I've got it as log normally distributed because uh, hazards do have to be non negative. Uh, and the this the mean of that baseline hazard here I have is depending upon the uh, the FEV1 uh, in this case that's the baseline FEV1 and uh, our antibiotic use in here and then finally our E drug here is just a inhibitory Emax style model where uh, the Emax is being restricted to the interval zero to one in this case. Uh, so you can see the way this is working, this E drug term then will be zero in the absence of drug, so HJ would just be H not J uh, for somebody on placebo is the way this is set up then. Um, and by s restricting Emax to between zero and one, uh, this thing should remain non-negative then. Uh, just use weekly informative priors for all of these things. You can see uh, the way we've restricted Emax to be between 0 and 1 is by fixing its prior to be just a uniform between 0 and 1. So I suppose you could argue that's informative in the sense that we're restricting it between 0 and 1, but between 0 and 1, all values have equal probability uh, in that. Uh, ED50, I've again used it uniform just to keep the uh, to avoid numerical errors by this thing wandering off to infinity or something like that. Uh, let's see, is there more I'm going to tell you about that? No, I think that's, I'm going to be setting you off then uh, to, to put that together. Uh, keep in mind you're going to be trying to, uh, for each individual then, uh, you will have, again, at least one, one record. Uh, you know, one, one observation if you like, though it may be a censoring observation. Uh, and but you may have multiple observations now in this and and you're going to have to also deal then with the uh, inter-individual variation term as part of this. So those are kind of the new parts. Uh, the rest of this is essentially the same as you've been dealing with so far as far as the uh, the single time to event case. So let me, uh, let's see, see if there's any more questions before I, I send you off to, uh, to work on this. Um, yeah, that's about it. Oh, and also just a reminder, uh, since some of you have mentioned the uh, time-dependent hazard topic is one you were uh, that you put priority on. Uh, if for some reason after today's discussion, if you've changed your priority ratings on it, please let me know on that too. Okay, let's see. I don't see anything popping up yet. I'll uh, I'll keep it up in case, as I say, there's a long question or a slow typer here. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and uh, see you again on Thursday.